Do you know how to tell if your baby is deaf? Do you know what questions you should be asking your doctor? Our guests today are the mother-daughter duo, Cindy and Heather Phillips, who join us to talk about how Cindy and her husband have raised two deaf children and some of the decisions that they've made to help their children become successful adults. Here's a sample of what you'll learn from their interview. It wasn't until she was two years old before she was like officially diagnosed and, um, you know, and we started to learn more about the hearing loss and what that involved. And then we um, mainstreamed them into our local school. Erin really struggled. Um, and in seventh and eighth grade, we opted to send him to a residential school. I'm Tonya Wallum, and I'm the host of the Water Prairie Chronicles, a podcast where we encourage parents of children with disabilities by interviewing people who understand the questions special needs parents may have. Connect with us on Instagram at water.prairie. Now let's meet the Phillips family. We welcome you back to the Water Prairie Chronicles. If you are joining us for the first time, thanks for checking in today. And um, today we have two special guests. We have Cindy Phillips, she's the mother of two children with hearing loss, and we have Heather Phillips, her daughter, who is a 26-year-old graduate student with severe hearing loss. So welcome, Cindy, and welcome, Heather, to the Water Prairie Chronicles. Thank you. So I'm going to start with Cindy. Could you tell us a little more detail about yourself? I just gave you just a slight little intro there, but if, if you can tell <laughs> us who, who, who you actually are. Okay, sure. Um, I have, well, I'll start with my family first. Um, my husband and I, we have three children. Um, our oldest, Brittany, is hearing. And then our two younger ones, Heather, here. And uh, we have a son, uh, Aaron, who has uh, hearing loss also. So two with the hearing loss, one with hearing. Um, I have my degree in education and uh, taught for several years. And uh, about, about seven years ago, I went back to school and now um, I am a sign language interpreter and I work in um, the school district working with uh, deaf children and interpreting. Well, I did not know that. That's, that, that is an yeah. exciting change in, <laughs> in status there. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, uh, you know, this, I would say 20 years ago, I knew very, very little about the deaf population, about sign language, and uh, it has definitely changed um, my life path. Right. Excellent. I I may have some, some additional questions for you, knowing that I, I was not aware that, that you had added that to as well. All right. Mm -hmm. So, Heather, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so, I am Sydney's daughter, the most wonderful daughter. Um, <laughs> I am in graduate school right now. I'm going to be graduating in December okay. and I'm working on getting my master's in social work. Cool. Um, what I have a job right now and I'm hoping to um, continue with this job after I graduate and that is working as a clinical case manager for people with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Cool. cool. So both of your career paths are right up the alley of what we're doing with Water Prairie Chronicles. Yes. This is great. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Now, for those that are, that are listening, um, I met Cindy and Heather years and years ago. We have a mutual friend mm -hmm. through my brother and sister-in-law. And, um, and so my brother-in-law actually um, texted me a while back and said, you know, have you ever th thought, thought, th thought about in interviewing them? And it's like, absolutely, I would love to have them on. So I was so glad that, it, that, it, that it's worked out to have you on. So let's go in. Um, so those that are listening, we like to to go through and just kind of walk through the early years whenever we can. And um, and in this case, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with Cindy, because Heather, you probably don't remember your birth very much. <laughs> and, <laughs> and those really early years. <laughs> but um, but Cindy, when well, let let let's start with um, when was Heather first diagnosed with hearing loss? Okay, so Heather has some hearing, um, not a lot. And, but she, when she was born, I didn't notice anything at first. Uh, she babbled and, um, you know, developed the typical development. Um, when she was about 
18 months old, I started being concerned. She was, first of all, very loud. So, so loud. <laughs> um, and I was noticing not only, she was picking up a few words. She was doing like, bye-bye, mama. But she, her speech really wasn't developing. But the thing that really concerned me, she didn't seem to understand. If I pointed and told her, go get your shoes, we're going bye-bye, she would follow the gestures. But if I just said the words, she did nothing. So the fact that she wasn't understanding the language is what really started to concern me. I took her to the doctor at 18 months and told the doctor that I was concerned. Um, the doctor said, you know, she was responding to noise, but the noise she would respond to would be, the dog barking or other really loud noises. Um, so the doctor was like, don't worry, don't worry, she's fine. I took her back again at 22 months. I was like, mm, no, <laughs> the speech wasn't coming along. She really, And she started to become very, very frustrated. She started having terrible, terrible temper tantrums. And I think she was just at the point where she had things to say and absolutely no way to say them. And um, so the temper tantrums were just horrendous at that that point. Um, so I took her in again and you know said, we need to do something here. Well, at the time, she had actually had lost weight. And um, so through a long, very long process, we started going in um, and our focus Stop being on her hearing, started being on her health. Yeah. In addition to Heather's hearing loss, it, totally unrelated, she has a vascular disease called uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. Oh, wow. So at the time, they weren't sure what it was, but it, she was losing weight. She had very, very high blood pressure. Wow. Um, and she became very, very ill. So the focus was away from, from you know, the hearing loss. It, it suddenly became unimportant to us. Right, right. And so uh, she was hospitalized for a while. And uh, during one of the tests, they said to us, you know, why we have her sedated? Why don't we check her hearing? Perfect. So she was two years old. Um, and they came in and they, uh, told us that I think we really got a unique experience through this because I think a lot of times when parents learn that there's some, you know, a hearing loss or something along those lines, it can be very devastating. And I totally understand that. We had the unique experience of we were talking life and death. We were talking that she may have to have a kidney transplant. We were talking like there was just all of these things up in the air. So when the doctor came in, he says, I need you to sit down. I have some bad news. We're, <laughs> we're thinking the worst. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so he came in and he's like, she has a severe hearing loss. And my husband <laughs> and I kind of looked at each other and we're like, okay, but <laughs> it seemed trivial at the time. So we, we had a little different you know, experience as far as that goes. But uh, so she was not, it wasn't until she was two years old before she was like officially diagnosed. And, um, you know, and we started to learn more about the hearing loss and what that involved. And Has that, all of it. Um, do you think it was the same from the very beginning when she was first born? Or do you think that it deteriorated some over those two years? No. I believe that she had always had that that hearing loss. Um, her hearing has has decreased a little over the years, but it has it's not changed much. And yeah, when I look back now, and I you know, twenty twenty hindsight is always perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's like so when I look look back now, and I was like, that's why she was so loud. That's yeah. why she was always right. like yelling because she could hear herself. She was getting some feedback when she would yell. Um, you know, and that's, that's why when I pointed, she understood me, but when I didn't, she didn't, you know, and 
So it was a lot of different things that, you know, looking back, I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. Right. So, Cindy, um, tell us a little bit about Erin. Okay, so Erin, uh, Erin is 19 months younger than Heather. Okay. So we had learned about Heather's hearing loss when he was born. So I was on the look for it with him. You know, I was I was more aware. Right. Um, they did do, with him, they did a newborn screening. Um, that was a brand new thing when he was born. Oh. Heather did not have it. Um, Aaron did. Okay. Was, they were just starting to do one. Um, so he had the newborn screening. He was awake during the newborn screening. He was moving around. So they said, his is a little off, but we think he's fine because, you know, we think it was just off because he was awake and moving. About four months old is when I started suspecting a hearing loss with him. Okay. I would go in when he would wake up from his nap. I would walk into his room and start talking to him. And he never would turn his head until he saw me. Okay. And I was like, he wasn't turning towards the sound. And that I was just more aware right. at that point. So I took him in for a hearing uh, test. And at six months, he was diagnosed. Okay. Is the level of hearing the same with the two kids? It's similar. Heather has a worse Heather's loss is more severe okay. than Aaron's. Aaron's more of a moderate, moderately severe hearing loss, where Heather's more severe. Okay. And then um, is there a genetic connection here? Yes, there is. Yes. Um, but it's one of those genetic things where both parents have to be carriers. And if both parents are carriers, then there's like, I think, a 50 50 chance. And, um, on my side of the family, my husband's side of the family, all the way back, no one knows of anyone that, that is deaf. So it's not something we've seen or suspected right. in our families. Well, this, this is interesting. So is there a name that, like a parent that's listening, that would know what it is if they were to hear? Honestly, off the top of my head, I don't know okay. exactly. I, um, with with hearing loss there are several genes there's some syndromes that it can be connected to it um can hearing loss can develop from illnesses and um right. injuries so uh, medications some medications even can cause hearing loss so um and honestly off the top of my head i don't okay. remember yeah so Heather, do you, okay, so your hearing has not changed much. I was going to ask if you remembered hearing as a child, but it hasn't changed much through the years. So um, did you and Aaron have a different type of way of communicating with each other separate from how you communicated with the rest of the family? Well, I feel like when we were younger, especially in the elementary years, um, we both were going to a deaf school in oh. the elementary. So we develop sign language a lot quicker than the rest of our family. So I feel like we were able to connect in that level earlier on until my sister Brittany and mom start really catching up quicker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how much how much older is, is Brittany from you? Three years older than me. Yeah, okay. A little over three years. So so mm -hmm. by, by by the time you were in school she was old enough to be learning. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so the the two of you were not able to to get by with much then if they were catching up with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, they caught up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> they tried. <laughs> Cindy, was there ever the option of the cochlear Im implants or anything like that for the kids? Thankfully, no. Um, they because they have enough residual hearing. That was never an option for okay. the two of them. I'm thankful it wasn't because it's a very, very difficult decision. Yes. Such a personal decision. Um, there's so many opinions for it, so many against it. It's it it 
I think almost feels like a lose lose situation, no matter what, which way you go. And so it's it's difficult. So I'm glad I did not have to make that decision because that's it's a challenging decision. It, it's hard to look in from the outside to know what you would do, and like, like you're saying, it's it is mm -hmm. it's it's a very Absolutely. personalized mm -hmm. choice. And I think even mm -hmm. within the same family, you may or may not have made the same choice for both of the children. Even um, I was just curious if that was something right. you had had to deal with or not. So, so it was taken out of your hands by yeah. not being there yet. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was. Is it? And I don't yes. know much about about the process with that. Is that something that, as an adult, Heather, you would have the choice of if you ever wanted to take that that route? Um. For me, because I'm not, um, I don't have a severe, severe enough hearing loss that I don't think it would actually become an option for okay. me. But I have had friends who um, their hearing loss had decreased over time and that option became available to okay. them later in life. I actually have two friends who recently in the last couple of years um, got cochlear implants and made that choice for them. Interesting. Themselves. Okay. The um, there's a family that I follow on Instagram, and I find it interesting because sometimes she'll post that um, they're having a quiet morning because the boys do not want noise. <laughs> and so, so mm -hmm. I, I, in, in some ways, I think it'd kind of be nice that if sometimes she could just turn off the sound. <laughs> so, ha Heather does that with her hearing. Yeah, aids. that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Heather more so than Aaron. Heather will purposely not put the hearing aids in. Really? So she doesn't hear. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, Especially in the morning. Yeah, because there's times where you just, the peace and quiet, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're able to control it better Absolutely. than the rest of us can. <laughs> we have to stick something, <laughs> we have to do the opposite. We have to stick something in our ear to, to block it off <laughs> where you're able to take it <laughs> exactly. off. <laughs> so I guess that there, there is no, no perfect world as far as that goes. <laughs> <laughs> so the kids were learning sign in school. Cindy, when did you and the rest of the family start learning sign? Okay, so when Heather was first diagnosed, um, we started with early intervention. And so they were coming to the house. We had a teacher of the deaf that came to the house and a speech therapist that came to the house twice a week or an hour and worked with the kids. Um, the doctors I had um, told me not to to teach my kids sign language because it would delay their speech. They wouldn't talk. Okay. Um, and um, I was getting a lot of pressure not to because they have some hearing is what I kept, right. uh, they kept saying to me. Um, the and, and we already discussed how Heather was having horrible uh, temper tantrums. So the teacher of the deaf that came in from early intervention said to me, let's just try anything and everything and see what works and see what doesn't. That was the best advice I ever got. <laughs> um, so we started using sign language. And um, one day, so I started learning with Heather at, you know, two years old, sitting on the floor with the, you know, very simple baby, almost the, like the baby sign, right. you know, the more and, you know, we were learning just a few words at a time. And the one day I was making lunch and I said to her, I'll make you peanut butter. And she signed back to me, no, cheese. <laughs> and <laughs> it was, it was so, I, it was the first time I had said something that she understood. She was able to say something that I understood. It was the first back and forth. Right. Um, that we had ever had. And from then on out, I was like, okay, we're, we're in design <laughs> language. This is working. We're communicating. We're understanding each other. Right. And from then on out. So I started taking um, classes, uh, community classes, okay. um, to learn sign language. And then uh, Heather... Uh, and Aaron went to the Learning for Center for Deaf Children in Massachusetts um, in elementary school. And their school offered sign language classes for the parents. And that's where I continued taking classes. So I was going to ask you about that. So um, we, so they, they went to the school for the deaf, but they went to the Massachusetts school for the deaf. Were you living in Massachusetts at the time? 
we were living in Massachusetts okay. at the time. We were living in Massachusetts at the time, and they went. And yeah. was that a residential school, or was it close enough to go as a day school? They had two campuses. One was residential, um, but our kids, we lived close enough to a day school. Okay. They went to the day school. Because mm -hmm. I know most states have... Yeah. Well, I know in North Carolina we used to have two, but now it's just one residential school. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and there, yes. and that is the day school. So, if you're not close enough mm -hmm. to get there, you're you're staying. Right. Um, and at, at mm -hmm. a young age, that's difficult to do. So, I'm, so I'm, yes. I'm glad you weren't yes. able. You, you weren't having to make that choice. In addition to others. Yeah. Well, actually, we we did. Well, we can get into this a little bit later on, uh, but uh, we did, when we moved to Pennsylvania, Heather was in fifth grade, Heather? Yes. Fifth grade, fifth grade. Entering fifth grade, Aaron was entering, he would have been in third grade. Third. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, they did one year residential at uh, Pennsylvania School for the Deaf, which is in Philadelphia. It was not a real good uh, fit for them. I see you, Heather. Um, we, <laughs> <laughs> What's not a good fit for them? Um, then we um, mainstream them into our local school. Aaron really struggled. Um, and in seventh and eighth grade, we opted to send him to a residential school in Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania okay. School for the Deaf in Pittsburgh. And he did two years there. Um, so this is. You know, you were saying earlier about how you can have two children and they can have two separate um, sets of needs. And that was the perfect, you know, example. Like Aaron needed that. He needed everything in sign language. He needed um, where Heather needed more to be um, in in the mainstream school. Yeah. And, when I would think know, their needs were separate, different. I would think in that case, personality is going to play into it, too. You know, just normal mm, learning absolutely. styles, everything else are all part of that. Absolutely. Um, and mm -hmm. can they handle being away from the family unit during that time? Um, you know, yeah. another child may learn better in that environment, but they may need to be with their family. And so those are... Yes, absolutely. Those are difficult decisions that families have to make. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult. <laughs> so we're going to need to break this apart because now you're presenting very different types of schools. <laughs> And throughout their <laughs> throughout their education, they were both in different types of schools. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So when they were at the school for the deaf, and of course I have to have to, mm -hmm. to fix that because we've always talked about the school for the blind in our house. <laughs> so, so, so I have to make sure I'm not I'm not focusing in there. <laughs> but the um, so they would have had their academic plans. Everything would have been catered toward their their learning needs while they were there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about that first, because that was their first schooling experience. Mm -hmm. um, how, Heather, when you first started, were you in first grade or kindergarten when you first started at the one in Massachusetts? I believe kindergarten in my class. Or, okay. was, yeah. or was it preschool? <laughs> Did she go there for preschool? No, she actually went to the local uh, public school special ed preschool. Okay. okay. The um, so you so you went because you were in mass, so we had the same thing during those years. So you mm -hmm. had the early intervention in the house till they were three, mm -hmm. and then they went to the local, wh whatever the local school yes. was offering for the was exactly was mm -hmm. yours like ours was. Um, we had it was a half and half classroom where they had um, children with special needs as half of the class and then peer models for the other half. Yes, yes, it was. So I mm -hmm. wonder. I wonder if that's a yes, statewide model that they use then in Mass. Mm -hmm. The because um, when we went to Pennsylvania, we didn't have the peer model side of it. It was just right. just an mm -hmm. all inclusive class. So once you got to kindergarten, you would have been at, at a school that that could accommodate for your hearing loss. Was it? Did you feel like it was easy to make friends because all the kids had similar communication styles? Yeah, I would say I. I'm pretty sure the first thing I did as soon as I walked into the door is made a friend. <laughs> nice. <with somebody. laughs> like, it's just an instant connection. And I mean, I still am friends with a couple of them. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, cause I'm thinking it kind of, it, it sheds that even, even though you're little, you still know differences on it. And it kind mm -hmm. of sheds that piece of being on the outside looking in. Now you're in, on the inside 
and anyone else is looking in now. So. Right. So the, um, and so did you, did you feel with, so you were, you were at, at the school through seventh grade? How, no, how old were you? I was there until um, fourth grade and then we moved to Pennsylvania. Okay. And that's when I was for the um, Pennsylvania School for the Deaf was fifth grade. Okay. So you were in a, either, either residential for fifth grade or the day school through fifth grade. Day school, day school. Through, okay. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then, and then you were sixth grade, you started with public school. <laughs> so when you were in, in that environment, did you feel that you were in a bubble type that you were separate from other kids, like in the neighborhood and all, or did you feel like you still could make friends with your neighbors and had playmates that were outside of school? Um, for that sake, I would give a lot of credit to the principal. Um, her name's Nancy. Um, because I went to Girl Scout and that was like a huge way for me to integrate into, nice. um, the rest of everybody outside of that <laughs> little bubble. And Nancy helped me like integrate and learn skills and advocate for me to help me a little bit for that. And mom was there to kind of give me that little push I needed. Right. <laughs> but sometimes I forget that it's a bubble too, because all, all my closest friends are from that school. Exactly. I went to all the yeah. birthday parties and stuff. So I like, sometimes I forget it's a bubble. But yeah, I was able to get out and integrate a little bit more, mainly through Girl Scout. Right. The um and I and like I said, it's in our family we're more familiar with the school for the blind, but it's kind of the same way where mm -hmm. you have this learning group that's together, you're growing and developing together, and so your closest mm -hmm. friends are all are all there and right. you share a very common bond that no one outside of that environment understands. And um, the families do to a, to an extent, but they haven't even lived in that little bond. That's that's such mm -hmm. a tight knit group, right? Um, but the real world is still beyond that door, and mm. and sometimes sometimes what I'm hearing is that it can be hard to go from growing up in that as as we call a bubble, and then having to all of a sudden launch out when you're 18, <laughs> and, and now mm -hmm. and if you haven't had that, so I get I give your principal kudos for that because that that was mm -hmm. that was a great and a perfect example of teaching you to start integrating into other environments mm -hmm. that may not feel as safe or as secure, but are necessary to start learning for you to be the adult right. that you're going to be. Um, and so, and the scouting program is a good, good start. Um, I know your mm -hmm. family, so church would have been part of your family too. So mm -hmm. that would have also been uh, an area. So were you involved in children's ministries or in youth groups when you were growing up too? Yeah, um, I also went, like, there was um, a camp, like, a family camp, that, like, it's a Christian family camp, so I've been to that for a while, and a children program. I think I was even at a play for the church at one point, was I? A play? Yeah, it was for a Christmas play. Yes, I get it out. yes. There you no, go. You're so. right. <laughs> that was a long yeah. time ago, but yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's, and, and I, I wanted to talk about that because parents that are listening, they are going to have choices they're going to have to make. Mm -hmm. Um, and choosing to, to, if there is a school for the deaf that's within a commute mm -hmm. for them, ch choosing that is an excellent choice, but yes. maybe give them some ideas of how they can start helping their children, not just stay just there, but also to have friends when they're home from school and right. the, the, the child next door it's still okay to learn how to play and to, um, mm -hmm. to, to, to have friendships that are there so you can have the sleepovers and things mm -hmm. as you're growing up. The yeah. I think um, as the, when the kids were little, we did a lot. Uh, we had neighbor kids that would, you know, mm -hmm. play. And I really, the kids were very um, excited to be able to like learn. They, they were excited to learn some fine. They were really good about learning, you know, things they could and couldn't do. Like, you know, make sure Heather's looking at you. She's not ignoring you. Make sure right. she's looking at you. And they were they were good at that. They were really good at that. Um, I know Heather was sometimes the rock star at Girl Scouts because 
um, she would have an interpreter when they would go places. And so they got to sit in the front row and they got to sit right. first. So it was like, <laughs> all right, we got Heather. <laughs> you know, um, so, you know, it, it was a lot of education with the, with the neighbor kids too, you know, like just, you know, um, all the kids played sports too. That was another thing. And, um, Oh, Heather played softball. Aaron played, uh, well, they both played Little League. Um, and that became an issue with the helmets, the batting helmets. Yeah. They couldn't wear their hearing aids with the batting helmets on because they would get too much feedback. So it was a lot of, like, helping them and helping the coaches learn, okay, hearing aids need to go in this particular place so we don't lose them right. while they're off the bat. You know, you're they're not going to be able to hear you yelling at them. Right. <laughs> sure, you know. um, so it was a lot of, you know, just trying to to let people know what, what was expected. And people were usually pretty good about that. Good, good. The, um, yeah, the sports is something that I was wondering about too. Were there any restrictions? Mm -hmm. For any activities? Oh, no. I mean, they, they did a little bit of everything. Good. Like I said, sometimes the hearing aids had to come off. And um, then it became a matter of, you know, making sure that um, coaches or whatever were, you know, looking at them understood, you know, they understood what had to be done. But um, I think as a deaf and hard of hearing child, one of the, the skills they learn very young is to copy what their peers are doing. Yeah. So even when they don't know what's going on, if they see everybody else starting to run laps, they know, oh, okay, this must be yep. what I should be doing now. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, they both had those skills to, to follow along. And sports, I think a lot of times were easier for the kids to do than even like scouts because it didn't require as much communication. Like you right. had your directions, but there wasn't constant talking. And so it was easier for them to be, feel more involved. Right. What I'm thinking too in baseball and softball. So you have your coach at third base. He's going to either wave his mm -hmm. arms at you or hold up a hand to stop or something. You know, he, he's going right, to be motioning exactly. to you <laughs> as well as yelling. As well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> because you can't exactly. hear anyway because it's <laughs> with all the noise. <laughs> right, right. When the kids transferred to the public school, were they on an IEP mm -hmm. or a five hundred four at that point? IEP. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for parents, would you stress that they need to insist on an IEP, or is there a reason with hearing loss that they would ever be on a five hundred four? Um, I would be surprised to see a child with hearing loss on a 504. Um, most children with hearing loss, most have some sort of communication uh, delays, some sort of speech or communication delays, language delays. 90% um, of deaf children have hearing parents. So communication, a lot of times when you heard our story about how they're being two years old before right. there was really any kind of communication. So there's language there lost that, right. that, that she missed out on. So I think the majority of deaf and hard of hearing children are, are, are playing catch up. They're trying to, you know, fill in the gaps that they missed that some of their peers would have learned. Um, otherwise there's even things like when you think about, uh, situations where you might be walking through a grocery store and you hear people talking like, oh, did you hear this big storm coming in tonight? And those kind of things that people are chatting about, not directly talking to you, those things get missed with right. a deaf and hard of hearing child. So they're missing out on all that incidental learning. Um, so there's always some sort of delay. So it would, it would surprise me if a child was not on an IEP. I'm thinking too, you're going to always need specialized instruction. So that alone uh, would be enough to, to require an IEP mm -hmm. over 504, mm -hmm. if I understand it correctly. Mm -hmm. The um, And I asked that question just because I know we have parents who have always had to battle to, to even get the IEP to begin with. And many of our mm -hmm. listeners have been in that situation where they've been presented with the 504 because it's an easier plan. 
but it's not meeting the needs right. of what their child needs. And so I like to at least right. find out what everyone else has had to, mm -hmm. um, to at least give them an idea of what, 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 what they need to be asking for. Mm -hmm. So Heather, once you were in the public school, so you're in sixth grade now and beyond, yep. did you have, like, were you pulled out for special instruction with your, with a, a special ed teacher? Um, I was pulled out for a speech therapy. Okay. That's, I, I was going to ask which, um, which, 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 which yeah. type of teacher you had. So, so for speech therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When um when you were at uh, the oh, can I just jump in? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. There. She was okay. She was also pulled off pulled out for um to work with a teacher for the deaf. Um okay. so that was a lot of those self advocacy skills, uh language support and that kind of thing. Okay. So, so you had the speech specialist, you had the, um, the teacher of the deaf, and then were there any other? Mm -hmm. Um, I also had a sign language interpreter for, um, for one year. I think no, it's, it's actually less. Yeah. It's a year and a half. We're going to go year and a half. <laughs> year and a half. I had a sign language interpreter for a year and a half. Now, did the interpreter go to all your classes with you? Yes. Was that the first two years that you were in public school? Okay. Yes. And so after that point, were you able to to hear what was happening in class when your teachers were teaching? Um, I was able to develop like um, skills that help me um, understand better. And if I'm being blatantly honest, the interpreter was not the best interpreter. Oh. <laughs> Which is one of the main pushing point of getting rid of her because in the second year we actually started with the interpreter and then we slowly faded it out and my grade went up. So they're like, hmm. All right, let's not do that. That <laughs> seems to be working better if you don't have one. Okay, so it so that it it put the pressure on you though to figure out how to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. when you're teach, so when you were there, when you were at the point without the interpreter, I'm thinking how many times a teacher has their back turned to the class. So how did you handle those situations? Um, it depends on the class himself, because for example, math and science, I, I can understand it so easily that when they have a turn around and I can't quite understand what they're saying, I can figure out what they're right. talking about based on it. Um, but for like English or history, I'll miss a name or something. I have to go turn to my friend and be like, who is she talking about? <laughs> but, oh, okay. Thank you. So I, sometimes I had that friend to kind of piggyback and there's been times where I go to the teacher and be like, I forgot. Did you say this paper is due tomorrow or next week? And I kind of can ask those questions after class, right? And that can kind of fill in some of those gaps, right? The, yeah, because I'm I'm thinking through how many different types of accommodations that are offered to students, and I've never thought through what a student would need. Mm -hmm. Would you use a copy of teacher notes? Did was that ever an accommodation you used? Um, it was offered to get um, well throughout my entire um, school year. It was an option to get a teacher. Um, no, I was, I could even get a peer note. This was especially more popular in, um, high school and college was to get a peer, um, note. So, so as they're taking notes in the class, you get a copy of what they wrote down. Okay. Yes. Which did you prefer? I prefer the peer note because it's a lot more concise and focused. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what it, what my peers are getting from it. This is probably what I'm going to get from it too. Right. I'm not going to write down every single name and date <laughs> that a teacher would. It's like a peer is much more real. Right. Um, Heather, how did you explain to your classmates about your hearing loss? Was that, I'm thinking middle school. Let's, let's lo look at that time period. How did you explain it? And was it easy to explain? Um, in middle school, in particular, when I had the sign language interpreter, usually people would <laughs> post me. It's like, so what? What's this lady following you? 
and that's where I can start explaining. But even when I didn't have the interpreter, um, I usually explain be like, yeah, I'm deaf. Um, I can hear you with these hearing aids on, but if I don't have them, I can't hear that well. And they always think that's cool. I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Can you hear that? Can you yeah, hear that? Of course. <laughs> they always go into that kind of stuff. <laughs> And, you know, um, adults can be ju just as, as bad about testing you, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think when that happens, I don't think it's a child or an adult trying to tease or anything like that. I think they honestly are trying no. to understand. And, and yeah. I actually like whenever I hear it because it shows that they're interested and they, and they, and they mm -hmm. want to, to try to understand it from, from your point of view. So I may be wrong yeah, for I mean, some, but <laughs> I mean, for, um, especially now with like little kids, whenever they ask me, they're like, what is that thing in your ear? I'm like, it's a hearing aid. It helps me hear. Do you know how glasses help people see better? I have hearing aids to help me see, hear better. And they're like, oh, that's cool. So that's like a nice, simple way to like explain it to especially young kids. So were you ever tempted to tell anyone that you were part of the Secret Service or any type of spy no. gang? <laughs> no. That, that sounds like something more Aram would try. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really a spy. The president's in my ear right now. <laughs> um, what were, Heather, what were your greatest challenges in elementary and middle school? Um. The greatest challenge in um, middle school was because I was transitioning from a deaf school into a public school. So that transition was quite difficult. One, because it's middle school. Middle school is already hard enough. Um, second, I was going from a very different environment. Because deaf school, you have the deaf culture. Deaf culture is something that's like, really ingrained into the deaf community and going from that culture to public was a bit of a culture shock as you would say yeah and it was a difficulty because um as my mom mentioned earlier um when i was in the pittsburgh not not pittsburgh philadelphia school for the deaf it was not a very good school and i actually fell behind on some of my learning and that caused some issue for me to try to catch up to sixth grade where I should be at in terms especially English. English was my struggle. Yeah. Um because I had to learn a lot of things. I had to catch up to everything. Um so that would, I would say, my biggest struggle is because I was transitioning and a lot of things were happening at once. Um, I honestly cannot name a struggle in elementary school good. because I love that school. <laughs> I love my years. I have nothing but good memories. Good, good. So what about um, high school? High school was a lot easier than middle school. Um, by then... I figure out who I am, how I'm going to integrate into the world, and I figure out how, like, I figure out my friends and my social life, and I got a group going, and I was able just to be me, and people accepted that. If they didn't accept that, well, they're not my friends anyway, <laughs> so... It was a lot easier in high school. I think developmentally, middle school is hard for everyone just because mm -hmm. you're going from that security of everyone just being free and easy and accepting each other to being aware all of a sudden that there's differences between mm -hmm. everyone. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, no matter what environment you're in, I think middle school is hard, harder for mm -hmm. some than others, but I think it is a hard transition. But it mm -hmm. sounds like you actually came to your own younger than a lot do if if high school was, mm -hmm. it was as easy as that for you because that does carry into high school for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I, I give give you a lot of credit for having that strength of knowing mm -hmm. this is who I am. These are who my friends are. And if you're not along for the ride, tough, <laughs> just <laughs> because, because it, it really can cause, cause stress. 
but um, but everyone has to get to that point to to keep moving. So um, so it, it it does help. And I think the sooner, well, I, I saw it too with my own kids, and I've seen it with others. I think in high school you start gravitating toward like minded friends, and mm -hmm. and and yeah. like you were saying, you don't really worry so much. Like when I was in high school, you you you, you had your different groups. I kind of had friends across the board. But I had my little group that we really didn't care about whether we were popular or not. You know, <laughs> we were just us. Exactly. We were popular among each other. So it, it's the, the only thing, only thing, thing that 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 was important to us. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, Cindy, when the kids were in the first school, so when they were in the school for the deaf, mm -hmm. were you involved with other parents or with the school while you were there? Yeah, that school was really good about. Um, involving parents. Um, it was really nice. And that is one of the things I really missed when we moved to Pennsylvania, because when we were up in Massachusetts, we spent um, a lot of time. Uh, we, we had sign language classes with other parents. Oh, good. Um, yeah. And um, the kids, there was, a, it was a small school. The kids were in um, small classes. So, and they were with those same kids year after year. So we really got to know the parents, you know, when kid would have a birthday party, it was a whole, you know, it was the same thing. So they became, the parents became really good friends. And it was nice to be able to have that where I could talk to other parents and, um, you know, how they were, how they had the same struggles as I did. And, you know, be able to like, think out, you know, like this worked for me, you know, maybe you could try this or, you know, different things like that. When we moved to Pennsylvania, and I think this is probably um, more common than not, is, is there are only, uh, there were three deaf children in the school district. Okay. One, so it was my two. <laughs> right. And there was a much older um, girl in, in the school. And so, I didn't have any connection with any other right. parents. The kids didn't have that connection with other deaf kids, yeah. really. Um, so that was, it, it was a struggle. That That is difficult because um, having that parent connection is really, really important. Um, I think it's probably a little easier now because there's so much social media that was, yeah. um, you know, not as big when my kids were younger. Um, so there's, you know, easier to get connected with parents now, but that, that definitely was a, a challenge. Did you find any organizations that could help you get connected with other families? Yes, I did. Um, the American Society for Deaf Children um, is a national organization. Um, and they do gear towards more sign language. Um, and I know that's not everyone's choice, um, but they have um, so many different, um, they, they offer, right now, um, they offer online sign language classes. They offer um, deaf mentor programs where um, children can get connected right. with deaf adults. The families can get connected with deaf adults and um, that kind of thing. Um, what they had when my kids were younger, I think they still do this, is they had conferences. And they were family conferences. So the whole family would go. Um, the kids would have all kinds of, it would be a week, uh, uh, four days maybe. And the, the kids would go and it was almost like a camp situation for them. Um, and while the kids were doing their things, the, the parents would go in and do different workshops. Um, okay. And then they would have family activities. It was wonderful. It really helped us connect with other people. And um, people came from all areas, all different kind of points of view, which was nice to to, to be able to, you know, hear what, how other people were, were um, doing things. So um, for those that are listening, we'll put the link to that organization in the show notes mm -hmm. and in the description if you're watching on, on YouTube mm -hmm. so, that, so that you can check that out. <clears throat> and, um, and I'm sure they, 
they have activities happening now too with it. Yes, um, they do. I, I noticed, I went to the website recently and I did notice they even had um, resources in Spanish, nice. including in-person Spanish um, things. So that's, uh, that is really nice too, because that's an extra challenge right. when you have a third language coming in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> This podcast is made possible by support from our listeners. We want to give a shout out to our superfan, Praveen S. If you want to help offset the cost of producing the Water Prairie Chronicles, become a supporter at buymeacoffee.com slash water prairie. Cindy and Heather had so much information to share that we decided to cut their interview into two episodes. Part two will be released as episode number 38 of the Water Prairie Chronicles. Be sure to join us to hear how Heather navigated through college and living on her own for the first time and what she's doing today. I'll post the link for the next episode so you don't miss the rest of the story.